interact with us today. And perhaps the only thing more enjoyable for you would be to travel down to Louisa, Virginia and see where Paul lives and works. It's a wonderful old house in a rural setting and there are cats and dogs and chickens in the yard. And I think there's also a cow and pigs and a goat that I didn't see. Um, beside the house, there is a studio. And in the studio, there is a cassette mastering deck, a 16-channel mixing board, a keyboard synthesizer, and a plain old grand piano. And this is where Paul Breyer composes music for films and television programs. Perhaps I should um, step back a little bit and, and tell you how Paul Breyer um, came to work in Louisa, Virginia with this um, wonderful combination of animals and technology. <laughs> he graduated in 1966 with the highest honors from Parsons College. He then went to the University of Miami to do graduate work where he studied with Clifton Williams. He always knew that he wanted to be a composer, so of course he came back home to Washington and went out to Fox's music store in Falls Church and managed the store. He also played on weekends and he once had a job playing clarinet in an orchestra that was recording music for a film that the U.S. Department of Agriculture was producing. Paul liked playing in the orchestra, but he felt the music was pretty lousy and he could do better himself. So he told himself, and the next time they needed music for a film, they called on Paul, and he did do better. And for the next three years, he worked with USDA producing films. One of the films that he produced was for a series. It was a children's show, Mulligan Stew. And um, that was picked up by PBS and is still being aired, I guess, and has won numerous awards. And I was very impressed to find out that the record from the show was sold over 9 million copies. So here's Paul still in Washington being very successful, but also um, with a desire to get out of a hectic life in the city. So about 10 years ago, he moved his family to Louisa, where he's continued to be successful, but I think he's enjoying it more. In addition to his composing, he also has started his own record label called Virginia Arts, and he has produced a number of records um, of local artists. I think by this time I've probably whetted your interest in Paul Breyer, so I'm going to let him do the talking. Please welcome Paul Breyer. Well, first I should say thank you. And I'm not well prepared for today because I'm not really a public speaker, but I write music and I love music and I have known some of the people here at the Copyright Office for quite some time. And Jody and friends suggested that it may be difficult for some of you to understand where the copyright process comes in to what the professional composer does. And I thought what I'd like to do is start at the very beginning of the process. That is, when a producer or director comes to me and says, we need music for a film or a television show. Kind of guide you through it, and maybe you can understand better where the part of the process that you have to deal with comes in and how valuable it is to composers and uh, musicians. Now, I have worked with people that I started working with at the uh, Department of Agriculture in 1969. I've been working with many of those people ever since then. Uh, one of them is Ira Klugerman, who is a producer, and he now heads up a company called the Educational Film Center in Annandale, and that's, that's who I really work for. We are, in turn, employed by PBS to produce television series. For the last two years, we've been employed by the Annenberg Foundation to produce a new series as part of their telecourses. You may have seen one or more of their telecourses, the, the Mechanical Universe and uh, various programs that they're running now. They have a new one premiering this September called Economics USA. It's a series of 30 shows designed to be used by college age people and maybe people a little older, in fact maybe people as old as I am because I've learned a lot about the economic system just doing the television show. And when the producers, actually when Annenberg Foundation came to the Educational Film Center, they wanted a contract for the entire series. They wanted, they had certain amounts of techni technical information that needed to be imparted to the students. 
and they had a certain number of uh, things that happened in the economic history of the United States that they wanted to emphasize. And aside from that, they said to the Educational Film Center, uh, let's do it. So the Film Center, as I'm the staff composer there, they came to me and the producer told me approximately what kind of score he wanted. He wanted a theme song. He wanted a Victory at Sea theme song. Uh, I hired members. We have a member of the Air Force Band here today. I hired members of the Air Force and Marine Bands and some of the local uh, union musicians and put together a 35-piece orchestra and brought some of my equipment up to a room in Silver Spring, uh, which is owned by a friend of mine. He calls it a recording studio. And, and we put the group together and did the recording for the theme song there. Now, I have a studio of my own in Louisa, but Charlottesville, which is the closest large town, even though it's home of the University of Virginia, does not have a, there's not a good music department there. In fact, some of you may, if you witnessed one of their concerts, you would say there's no music department there. Uh, I hope there are no music graduates of the University of Virginia here. They do, they do have a music program. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not a performance program. It's uh, more or less a history program. And I think you can go as far as a master's degree there in that kind of activity. Uh, I found it difficult to get good musicians where I live to do this type of recording uh, and get them all together at the same time. So large orchestra work I still do here in Washington. Uh, I've also recorded the Marine Orchestra at their recording studio at 8th and I. Uh, it's a large, very nice recording facility and they can record a, an orchestra as large as you want to amass in Washington. But the producer told me what kind of thing he wanted. I, I went back to my studio and created on a series of synthesizers, I created a theme song. Now normally when I'm producing a song or a, a piece of thematic material, I would do it simply on the piano. And then I'd go to the producer and I'd say, this is what I'd like to do. The melody would uh, be exposed first on the French horn and then it would be the background uh, instruments would basically be string section or something like that. Usually, the producers I work with are versed enough in musical terminology that they can understand what I'm talking about. But many times when you get into a complex piece of music, the producer will want to know more about, um, if you know the music of John Philip Sousa, you know that there are, there are themes within themes going on. There are things that one of you may recognize out of Stars and Stripes Forever, that it's going on at the same time that something else would be what someone else would recognize as being the theme. There are multi-level uh, themes happening in music. And many times it's more easily understood by the producer if I can synthesize things and show him just where those themes will be occurring in the orchestra. I have some examples of some things that I've done here, and maybe at this time, I'll play one of them. When the Annenberg Foundation finished up production of this year, that is, this coming September's television series, they wanted to do a promotional piece, which essentially lets you, the viewer, and the station managers along the route know about what new materials are available. So the Annenberg Foundation came to us, the Educational Film Center, and requested a 15-minute piece which explains to the viewer, and this will be shown four or five times over the summer, and to every station manager along the line, a piece which explains the the new material that's available from Annenberg, this new learning, these new learning courses, and runs down some of the old courses that are continuing. So they wanted a piece of music which was kind of like masterpiece theater in, a, in feeling, and in fact that's the word they used to me. They wanted a masterpiece theater piece uh, that had no money, uh, naturally. The budget 
the budget on many of the uh, public television things is very, very low, and if it weren't for copywriting and eventually receiving royalties, it wouldn't be worthwhile to do it. Uh, this particular piece of music they wanted, I, I can't remember the length of it, somewhere 25 or 30 seconds. And the music would occur as a scroll is unraveled saying, Annenberg Foundation presents for your, uh, let's see, the scroll didn't unroll on the video that I had of this, but it's <laughs> essentially for, for approval. The, when they send me a video, uh, many times they'll say there'll be a, since I live in an area where we're not served by overnight UPS or, or uh, mail, they, they put a, <laughs> I need overnight mail. I'm not that far out. They'll many times put a video cassette on a bus and they'll say, uh, my friend Shirley Wendell here has a home in Orange uh, that's near the bus terminal and they'll say there'll be a video on the bus term on the bus at 10.30 in the morning. And I go pick it up, I look at the thing. Many times it's not nearly what you see on the air but months later. This particular one was not. But it was a scroll and they wanted a kind of a black tie feel and wanted it basically to be classical in feel. And I composed a piece of music on the synthesizer, sent it for their approval, they approved it. And when they called back with their approval, they said, we need it tomorrow. <laughs> so it just happens that within the last year and a half, I purchased this piece of machinery here, which is a digital sampling keyboard. Now, digital sampling is not really a synthesizer. It's not a synthesizer. It's a, it's a computer. It's a piece of computer hardware that just happens to be musical hardware. It's, uh, the material that's in it is on the Macintosh type disc. And it's essentially a recorder, but it's a digital recorder. And the easiest way to explain how it works is just to start from the beginning, and I'll show you that. Now, a digital sampling keyboard, you enter material into it the way you'd enter it into a tape recorder. And I'll just make it as graphic as possible. I press a button which says sample lower keyboard and test to make sure the volume is all right. Testing one, two, three. Now this has recorded what I have said and it will record any sound. It'll record a gunshot or a musical tone, uh, a drum beat, uh, long pieces of music uh, to a certain extent. It only has a certain number of seconds capability. Now. I don't know if you can hear this. It'd be unfortunate if you couldn't, but I could turn it up a little, I guess. It has now in the keyboard. Now it's, the digital sampling is picking up some noise here, which we would normally filter out. But and there are problems in digital sampling. I'm not saying that this is, this is as easy as, as you may think. It is rather difficult and it's complex to get a good sample in the keyboard. But what I've done is put a tone, my speaking, in the keyboard, which it now breaks up into 12 sections and you can make scales out of it. And you can see that if I took a, a violin or a clarinet or, or anything really, I could, I could not only, this is not synthesizing the sound, it's actually recreating the, the acoustic sound. And if I wanted the sound of a piano recorded from six feet away and I wanted it in my keyboard, now normally you'd not be able to get that kind of sound. But I actually set up my keyboard this was the first program I ever did. It took me about three days to get this, this sample. But once I had sampled it and modified it to my, to the, 
I guess the, the best word to say is uh, specifications that I wanted. I wanted a, the sound of a piano recorded from a few feet away. I did not want a close mic piano sound. This, this sounds like a piano because it is a piano. Now the, the abilities that a digital sampling keyboard has also include the abilities to take various parameters within a sound, that is envelope, um, equalization or treble and bass control, uh, detuning. You can take, it, each sample takes a number of different oscillators and makes them sound like the piano. Now I can detune this sound. That is, take one of the oscillators and remove it from A440 and take it down to A438, which gives you a kind of a honky-tonk sound. I've accessed the wrong one. That's... It's... Um, It has made the, the capability of the composer really at your fingertips no matter where you are. I'm capable of doing things that I could not have done before, especially under time, uh, severe time restrictions. I would like, that somebody just raised his hand, and I would like to make, if, I, if I'm losing anybody or if I'm being too simplistic, if you say we know all this before, I'd rather hear that because I don't normally do this kind of thing. And uh, there is a question, I'd be happy to take the question. Um, when you sample the you piano know, six feet away, do you have to sample each tone? In the oh, scale I, was going to, I was going to answer that question, I forgot. I'm sorry. <laughs> there, this particular keyboard is uh, the PC version of the very expensive ones. Very expensive ones are $100,000. Uh, they can sample a note, they can sample each note on the piano. This one, you can break up into eight sections on the keyboard, and you sample one note every every four or five notes. That way, you don't get chipmunky, as you can imagine. If I were to sing a note and sample it at, at one particular frequency, and then play it up two octaves, I'd sound like a chipmunk. That it's called multi-sampling. You're able to enter the most valuable tones from any particular instrument where they sound the best and most representative. Many times. You can get better sounds than you can get from an acoustic instrument. Uh, it's very difficult. Over the years, I've had difficulty not only hiring a timpanist, because timpanists charge by the hour, of course, like every other musician. Then they charge for the trailer that they have to rent to carry their instrument. Then they charge for the time that it takes them to carry it around. And normally, a timpanist is, uh, is a more expensive musician in the first place. Normally when I hire a, a timpanist it will it'll cost uh, 200 to 300 dollars for, for a session no matter how long the session is even if it's only for an hour. So this particular program I, I requested that the factory make this program. It's very difficult to sample low frequency tones that have a lot of overtones just because of the nature of digital sampling. But this particular sample also this particular program has several things that it's very expensive to get. Gong, a timpani, and uh, I'm not sure that there are other things. On, oh, temple blocks. I don't have temple blocks and I don't know anybody that does, so it's, it's useful to have these things. There are also, on the same program from the factory, there are rock and roll drum sounds like you hear on rock and roll records. Other sounds that are difficult to get and record well include uh, oboe. Oboe is a difficult instrument to record because the overtones tend to come out of the instrument um, aimed in different directions depending on where they're closing the tone holes on the instrument. 
So it's difficult to record the oboe uh, and make it sound good. Now I have an oboe program here that I created from some material that I had recorded. I did a, a television show for NBC last January. It was a children's show. And I had a very good oboe player. And I recorded him a lot. And uh, when he got into this instrument, now I have a foot pedal. I can, I can control breath, essentially, from a foot pedal. But there is also the capability in these instruments to attach a breath tube to the back and to control the breath by, by actually blowing. So, and this also has the ability to put vibrato on the, on the note. Now the vibrato is coming from, from one of the oscillators, which is beating against the main oscillator in this keyboard. The, all of these advanced keyboards have what's known as velocity sensitive keyboards. Uh, it's a velocity sensitive, it's a touch, like a piano. The harder you hit it, the more something happens. With the oboe, the harder I hit it, the more tonguing effect I get. Now, other of the programs on this keyboard, the, the string programs, the harder you hit it, the more of the attack that you get. Um, with, the, with the timpani program, the harder you hit it, the more of that initial explosion you get with the, with the timpani hit. It just happens that at the bottom of this, I bought this program. I didn't make this. This program is um, associated with the oboe. It's a bassoon program. I didn't create that. I've, I've never hired a bassoonist that I, that I could afford to spend the time to create a program like this. It's, uh, it's nice though, I have used it, I have used the two instruments for duets, where you, could, you can imagine. And when you build in a number of different instruments, it starts becoming very much like a real orchestra except that I have ultimate control over the expression of every instrument. Now, my undergraduate degree is music education, and I, I learned at that time to play every instrument there is a little bit. And I know what I want to hear. Many times, I can get what I want to hear out of this keyboard. If I can't, then I hire a musician. <laughs> I don't know whether that's saying something about myself. Or not. I also... I also play the clarinet, um, and I play French horn, and I play keyboards, of course, and guitar, and a number of, um, I can play at a number of other things, so mandolin. And so it gives me the opportunity, when something doesn't sound real, to throw in a few real instruments to really convince you that it's a real sound. <laughs> now, the first thing I'm going to play is this short piece, this masterpiece theater piece, this black tie affair. This is the piece that will be on the screen as the scroll unrolls to introduce you to Annenberg Foundation's new television series. Now, all of these things were created, all of these sounds were created on this instrument except for two clarinets and a flute, which I played live. When you have when you have a number of instruments which are similar in sound and they're in a similar range and you get perfect sounds beating against each other, the listener can easily tell that it's not real. That is, if there's a trumpet and an oboe and a flute all playing the same note and they are digitally broken down so that they're perfectly in tune, it doesn't sound like a real orchestra anymore. So, in, in any one range, you need to put a number of different uh, textures and live instruments help, even if it's only one out of a section of six, help fill out that texture. 
I hope I'm in the right place. Exactly for those people what they wanted. It, um, it gave the sense of kind of a, a chamber orchestra playing some uh, music that would be suitable for this type of occasion. But when the, when the producer comes to the composer and says, I have an, enough money in a budget to pay you so many dollars, and that doesn't even really cover the cost of my studio. I have, I have a recording studio, as Joey said. Um, and although I charge about one-third to maybe one-fourth of what similar studios do in Washington, I still have to consider that it costs me a certain amount of money just to operate. And when the, when the budget won't cover that, what do you do? And I do what most composers do, and that is I copyright my material. I don't let the rights to my material go. And I present my copyright forms and, and then cue sheets to the networks. And the networks all have an arrangement which allows for composers to be paid for the use of their music. Now, if everybody knows this, you stop me. But there are licensing organizations BMI and ASCAP and CSAC and some other small ones that actually take records supplied by composers and publishers of music in association with what show it's on, and then they actually log, they log television, they log TV guide, and they log public television stations, and they work out a series of uh, payments for composers so that for every time a certain piece of music is used on a network, they will pay you so many cents and then multiply it by the number of, the, of stations on the network, or there's, roughly. That's, there's complexities in everything, but that's basically what happens. And with PBS, it's a little bit different in that they have a kind of a fund that gets divided up among composers. But the royalties for a piece of music that I actually lost money on over, ten, over a 10 year period will make it worthwhile writing the music. I was telling Jody earlier that if a producer comes to me with a piece of film that I judge, and I've made mistakes, everybody makes mistakes, but if I judge it uh, not to have a long life on television, I've there's a good possibility that I just don't have the time to do it. The budgets, uh, the actual production budgets are too low to make it worthwhile to do something that won't have a life long enough to be paid royalties for it. This television series I just did for Annenberg, Economics USA, they're forecasting a life of five years. Um, when I saw the proposal and how it's and how it's presented, and the complexity with which it was put together. Lots of archival footage here that has never been seen before by the viewing public. Uh, David Shoemaker is the uh, local newsman, some of you may know, is the host of the show. But the show has, has big guns. It has the secretary of such and such, and the uh, president of AFL-CIO, people who will be in history books. And I see this television show as being as having an eight to ten year life, which will make it very nice for me. Uh, the production budgets just barely cover the cost of production. Now, I'd like to stop right here and take a, if there are questions, 
would have come up? Something you'd like to ask? Uh, are you implying that this is kind of a novel approach that you use where you retain copyright in your music rather than either transfer it to the film company? Am I implying that? Employee of the film company? Well, I know a number of composers personally. I work with other composers and it's, I can't say that there is any common approach by any composer that I know. There are composers who never bother to copyright their music. They get paid for producing it, they put it out and they just go on to the next job. There are others who write music constantly and copyright it and none, none of it ever gets used. And there are other composers who do like I do, they try to retain all the rights they can. Uh, when I have to sell something, I obviously have to get more money for it. Uh, I can't tell you what the, the Henry Mancini's of the world do, because I just don't know. But I know that composers who work in public television, they do documentaries, they do uh, videos for cable and that kind of thing, they're interested in retaining all the rights they can. Uh, I also have a publishing company which not only publishes records, but we publish music for a number of different things. And I have some composers who I have worked with in the past who work with me, and I essentially publish their music. And if I didn't publish, that is, if I didn't take care of copywriting it and registering it with BMI or ASCAP, they never would. I mean, I'm really performing a public service for them that they just, a lot of composers don't have a lot of business savvy, I think. I mean, they just don't, they don't realize what their, uh, their talents are really worth. Earlier in your career, did you, did you always do this, or did you have some bad experiences that led you to want to retain them? Well, I was, uh, the Mulligan Stew television series that I did in 1969 and 70 has been running on public television stations ever since then. It's been running for 15 years. It went into 1985, having sold nine million copies of the records to kids who are in fifth and sixth grades who see this program. And of course, at that time, there were no provisions for uh, public television to, to pay any royalties to any composers in the first place. And the, when you wrote something that was essentially for the government, that was a, a, a composer for hire there. And I just never had, I have just always signed off. They would give me a piece of paper saying, sign here, and I did, and I knew that I no longer owned that music. And I, I treat it differently now because I essentially lease my music in perpetuity to the, if, if it's a government organization, I lease my music for the use of, uh, for one particular program. That doesn't give them the right, that doesn't give the producer the right to use that music in some other program. Uh, I figure that I'm either, number one, I'm valuable enough as a consultant, a music consultant, that I can advise the, the producer about what type of music should be here to enhance the uh, action that he wants to portray, or I'm a good enough composer that I can write exactly what he wants and essentially be his musical arm. And and I don't think that under those circumstances that I should sell rights to my music or give them away. One more. When you lose it, do you depreciate it? Can you depreciate it? For tax purposes, yes. I can depreciate the $10 that it costs to register the copyright. <laughs> I think I can um, depreciate that over seven years. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's any investment tax credit or anything. Sure. I was just curious how long it took you to do the program from, from that elbow explain. How many hours did you listen to him play and record to get what you wanted? Oh, well essentially what I did, and anytime I get a really good performer, I tend to ask him to play long tones. Long tones with a good attack. And I and I'll get as many as possible. And and then I can use, I've recently done this with a cello, with solo cello. Uh, 
and I have done it with a number of other instruments. But it's, so it's a lot more have, complex than just plugging in a microphone and... But he didn't have to spend long hours. Oh no, I recorded him onto audio tape. Recorded. I have never made a good program by going directly into this machine. Never. Yes? When you say you make the program, does that mean all you're doing is recording the long tones of that instrument? Yes, I record his, his long tones onto regular audio reel-to-reel -reel tape. Then I pick the tones that are the most representative of what I want that instrument to sound like, and I enter them into the, the memory bank of the keyboard. That's your program. That becomes the program, right. And, and we have, even though I'm only capable of recording four seconds of material on each note, you have in this keyboard what's called looping. You can take the end of a note, or anywhere in the note, and repeat that section over and over. So, and in fact, on some of the, on some of the programs, you can hear where the loop starts. Uh, there are some programs that I have purchased that were done, uh, actually, I don't know who did them, but they were done by some, a representative of the factory. And I'll play, I'll play one of them for you, you can see it. It's, in order to make a tone last a long time, last longer than the four seconds of internal memory, Okay. You have to loop the sound. Now, some of the sounds, of course, don't need to be looped. You don't need to loop uh, timpani because the timpani normally doesn't last longer than four or five seconds, whatever you have. Now, on the upper reaches of this particular program, this is a Fender Rhodes electric piano. The Fender Rhodes is somewhat unique in electric pianos in that the tone is actually generated by a bar. It's almost like a tuning fork. There's a t separate tuning fork for every note on the piano. So when you strike it, you get that, that same kind of ping that you get from a tuning fork. And a tuning fork will, the, the tone will go on for uh, 60 seconds. So you can't, you couldn't let it die away. So they looped it right after the attack. And on the high notes, you can hear it. Maybe you can't. Like a wire. Maybe some of you could hear it here. What happens is it goes da 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 da. It's the loop point is very soft, but uh, you can hear it, especially when you're recording. And if you're recording the instrument solo, you can hear it. Um, all digital sampling keyboards have the potential of having problems in the looping. We have. Nobody that I know of has solved that problem yet. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. With as with any computer, there's a boot up disk. You when you when you turn the, this computer on, there's nothing in it. There is a series of analog filters, that is, uh, tone controls, that are built into it. They're always there. But there is nothing in this memory until you boot it up with a, with a, a normal, you know, it's like a program disk. Then everything else, all of these things, are accessed through that program disk. And as the instrument becomes more capable of doing other things, they continually update that disk. Right now, I just got version 3.7. I think there have been about 20 versions all along since I've had this for a year and a half. Who wrote the program that you used to do? I wish I knew. And I wish he had an 800 number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you did a project. Let's say you have a 25-second project. Do they give you a videotape to work with? I mean, do you compose music when you're watching the tape? Oh, that's a, that's a good point, because that's something that I wanted to bring up, too. And I'll go on to phase number two now, which I'll answer that. There are several different ways that producers approach the creation of music for their programs. Some producers that I've worked with, they get an idea. See, they, they've got a one-minute montage of uh, kids running through a park or something. And they would come to the composer at the script stage. And they'd say, they'd say to me, 
I have a 60 second spot here of kids running through the park. And I really like the sound of such and so, um, some song by a foreigner or something. That's some kind of popular thing that kids are into at the time. And essentially what I do is go and listen to that thing that he really likes, try to get something of the flavor of that, the, the overall feel. Of course, I, I'm not going to steal thematic material or chord progressions or anything, but there are there is uh, emotional feel in any kind of music, and I would look for that feel and try to create something like that. And then the editor would take my piece of music, lay it onto whatever it is, video or, or mag strip on film, and, and cut the film to it so that the, the kids jump when the music jumps and that kind of thing. That is the luxury of the composer, and very few composers get that opportunity. Maybe one job out of 20 for me would be like that. The majority of jobs that come to a composer are the producer comes to the composer and says, this show is together, it's to time, nothing can be changed, you've got to save this show. <laughs> and this happens in maybe not those precise terms, but this happens three or four out of every 10 shows that I do. The, the producer says, this isn't working the way we want it to. There's not enough empathy with this character, or there's not enough fun with this scene. We've got to, we've got to enhance that or save it, as they say. Most likely, that's what happens. So I'll take the progression from there. They will send a video cassette of the finished program to me, which has a soundtrack that is uh, synchronized voices along with the characters on the show. And it also has a time code strip. Now, time code is a digital information strip which can be used just about anywhere that there's a linear recorded signal. Uh, it can be used on, on reel to reel tape or uh, videotape. And it has the unique ability of, through its reader, being able to pinpoint by hour, minute, second, and thirtieth of a second exactly where you are on any tape. And if I see a show that has a piece requiring music that starts at two minutes and thirty seconds into the show, I, I press one button, that's a cue button. And when a picture change happens that has to have something uh, musically to enhance it, I press another, another cue button. And by the end of this, this piece of music, it may be uh, two minutes long. And there may be uh, 30 separate things that have to happen inside that piece of music. There may be accents that have to happen. There may be places where the lead instrument has to drop out so that some a barely intelligible piece of background um, voice is heard or something. There are any number of things that can happen in a long segment of music. And those all get programmed into a computer that I have, which then breaks down what would be the best tempo for me to work at so that everything, all of these things would be able to hit on beat. Now, if there's 180 beats in two minutes of this music, and I can make all of those various things that are supposed to happen happen on those beats, then I'm that much the better. If I can't, most likely I'll, I'll recompute the program so that I can get them to happen on beat. And then I write the music according to how many beats I had to work with. Now, ideally, of course, this isn't the right situation to work. You don't want to be confined by anything when you're composing music, especially music that has to say something emotional. But given the time frame that I and many composers are, it's the only way to work. You have to work that way. Now, I take my videotape. I've determined where the pieces of music have to be. I know exactly how long they have to be and where the various things have to happen within. So, I go out to my studio where I have a, a system which is basically, some of you may be familiar with the term MIDI, M-I-D-I, 
It stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface, and it's the ability of any digital instrument to talk to another one. Uh, it's very complex, and I don't understand the, uh, the technical aspects behind it, but it's, it's easy to demonstrate. Any MIDI instrument, whether it be a keyboard or a, or a drum machine or a synchronizing box, it can all be synchronized together. So I hook everything up to my video deck. And at 2 minutes and 30 seconds, I've got to start this piece of music. So we go to 2 minutes and 30 seconds, and I, and I compose the piece of music. I've got the, the beats going there already. I should explain how I do that. There's a, one of the basic sections of the musical instrument digital interface system is what's called a drum box or a drum machine or a rhythm composer. And I have one here with me today. This is a, this is a somewhat complex one. This is made by Yamaha. And you can program a tempo into it digitally, and it's a perfect tempo. And this tempo will follow the time code strip on the video. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to do this just so that you can see how this might work. I'm going to go to pattern number 40. I don't think there's anything on pattern number 40. And set my tempo. And there is something. Like something my son wrote. <laughs> if I go to uh -oh. I'm not going to be able to get out of this program. Well, suffice it to say that for right now without some reprogramming uh, that I have to do, there is, when I go to a new pattern, there is the capability here to get just a metronome setting out. Then I have the sounds of any drum or, or percussion instrument that I want right here at my fingertips, literally at my fingertips. I have bass drum, I have tom-toms, I have snare drum, I have hi-hat, I have hi-hat open, I have ride cymbal, I have crash cymbal, cowbell, shaker, rim shot. All of these are on computer chips, and if I want something that's not here in these 16, um, I just get another computer chip and plug it in. It's, it's really easy. And I can, I can clear any of these things into or out of the memory at any time I want to. Now, I'm going to clear pattern 40. Okay, and it's just, it, there's, a, there's a digital readout at the top here. And this has just told me that I have cleared pattern number 40. It's, a, it's just like a little readout on a, on a handheld computer. And it has a lot of fail-safe things built into it, which is real good for people who are not computer-oriented. I'm not really computer-oriented. Uh, now let's see, I'll go into real-time programming. I can't get it out. Oh, well. The metronome being perfect with the time code strip sets the tempo for me so that I can play the music that I've created and have it synchronized with the film. Then if I have to, I hire musicians who can come in and of course I lay that down on one track of a multi-track tape recorder. And, and then the musicians who are, are coming in to record can listen to that as a cue if they want to. Or I can conduct them if I want to. But most likely, what I'm going to do is to slow the tempo of this machine down. And I'm going to play slowly and very accurately the music one piece, one part at a time. Now, I'm Fender Rhodes. I can use Fender Rhodes piano sound. Before I go on, I think there's a question. I just wanted to clarify, how do you, let's say you have a two-minute segment to write, how do you determine what tempo you use and how many beats are within that two-minute frame? Oh, there's a computer program to do that. Uh, what, uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's not based on, my question is the tempo based on the action of the film. What, what determines the 
time. Yes, yes. Now, almost invariably, the tempo would have to be determined by the action on the film. But most people can't, deter can't t detect the differences, minute differences in tempo. They can't tell the difference between 135 beats per second, I mean per minute, and 138 beats per minute. And if I need to go, if 135 doesn't exactly fit and I need to go to 137, there generally isn't any problem with that. Um, I have to do that most of the time. I have to bend the tempo a little bit from the exact tempo that the producer's looking for just to make it work with the film. That's his punishment for not letting me do the music first. <laughs> yes? At what point in your mind are you thinking about the actual melody and chords that you want to use? You're talking about, you know, the, this timing track on yes. the video. Is your mind considering what you might want to fix, you know, musically when you first look at the video? And are you thinking about certain effects? I mean, do you just sit down and play from what you thought about, or do you fix anything on paper that, before you get to the point of working with the computer chips and the sound? That works differently each time. I can't work, and most composers that I know cannot work in a specific pattern. They, in the first place, it's very difficult to compose music under a lot of pressure. And what I do generally is go through the program and look at the program so that I know what the program is. I want to know what, what this program is about and who these actors are and what these people are supposed to be feeling and how they're moving and whether music could do something to make better the message that the producer or director is trying to get across. And many times I'll look at an entire show two or three times before I even start thinking about music. And of course, it happens on the second view and you say, oh, well, it's got to have a little piece of transition music there, or there's got to be something um, sweet there, or there's got to be something really heavy, or, or there has to be a musical effect there rather than music, you know, some kind of uh, sound effect, musical sound effect. And then generally, halfway through the second time or the third time, I'll actually start thinking about, I mean, consciously thinking about what kind of melody fits this sequence. Um, melodies just presented by themselves without harmonies many times can say things that depending on on how the melody flows the feeling about that piece of film will be very different. Uh, not only in terms of tempo but the, if, a melody, if a melody is moving in such a way that you anticipate what's happening, or, or you, you feel that you want to, you almost know what the music's going to be, but not quite, that helps with that same feeling in the film. And if there's something real simple music-wise, it allows you to get into the feeling of the music and really pay attention to the film. Now, sometimes I create a, the background for the, for the sequence before I create the melody. And the reason I do that is because it's easier for me as a section player. I've played in bands and orchestras all my life. It's easier for me to feel the, uh, the arrangement of the music first and to work with the melody as being the very last, most, most important thing around that. M many composers don't work that many way. Many composers work from the melody first. Uh, sometimes I do that, but not very often. Now, okay, she's going to change. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. There, the, the entire explosion in video and film is a double-edged sword. 
one edge being that it's a great medium for entertainment and education. The other being the more of something there is, the less it's worth. And when you run into the situation where you've got masses of material being produced for cable and PBS and networks, the, the budgets are to the point where you can't afford to hire real musicians. Uh, you just honestly can't do it. And when somebody calls me and says, can you do a musical score for a 15 minute show for $500, you know, I mean, you couldn't hire two or three good players for that. But I can do that now. I mean, if I don't have anything else to do, and you know, why not? At least uh, I own rights to it, and eventually someone else will need exactly the same piece of music. There are pieces of music which I've created over the last 10 or 15 years that I have, that I have leased to people for over and over again for commercial spots. I know composers that do nothing but create 30 and 60 second pieces of music. And they sell them or lease them to companies that uh, provide music for commercials, television and radio commercials. So in one I, I would someday, uh, you know, when I drink a glass of scotch at night and talk to my wife seriously, I, I just, the one thing that I always say is I wish that I could find six months and $5,000 so I could go away and write a piece of music that I was really proud of. I'm not saying that, that I'm not proud of some of the television music that I've done. Uh, I am proud of some of it that I've done, but mu much of it is disposable music. It's, uh, I don't, I'm not saying it's dribble. It's needed. It's necessary. It's just like the, the job of anybody in making a film. And to answer the second question, I don't create new synthesizer programs, personally. I used to do that. When I lived here in Washington, I worked for, as Jody said, I worked for the Department of Agriculture, and we did at that time, we, there was a, a film producing house over there at Agriculture. We, we did our own processing, we did all the shooting, we did 35 millimeter, there, everything from cameras to making the final prints was right there in the house. We produced some television, uh, some uh, documentaries for civil preparedness, part of civil defense. One of them was about a wide-bodied uh, jet plane accident in 1970, I think it was around Christmas time, in just south of Miami. And the plane crashed, carrying 350 people, and most of them lived, except they drowned in the, in the, uh, in the Everglades there. And they did a film about that that was very intense, and it was meant to pull emotions out of people to make them realize that this was a very urgent thing to have preparedness to deal with 350 injured people. The producer of that show, do uh, you remember Glenn Rinker? He was a Channel 4 newsman. Glenn Rinker was the associate producer and he did the narration on it. But Glenn and the producer and myself decided to use sounds that nobody had ever heard before. And they actually paid me for a week to come up. I had, I had a rather large Moog synthesizer at the time. They paid me for a week of creating sounds, which I did, and that whole show was scored with sounds that I, I'd never heard before, and I have very seldom heard any of them since. Uh, that's the last time I remember having the time, money, and uh, intellectual curiosity to do that with synthesizing. It's fun, but it's time consuming. I'll go on, unless there's somebody else that has a question. That's the one that's in the House of Representatives now. Yes, I'm somewhat familiar with it. I'm not sure that it's, uh, if I could talk to you later about that, uh, I'm not sure that's, I'm, I'm excited about that one. The, 
the subject, there's a, a bill in front of the House of Representatives now, which has to do with the necessity to sell the rights or to transfer the rights for the music to a program at the same time that other rights are transferred and whether or not there should be payments at that time and how the, the programs are going to be used. Um, I'm not familiar with all of the, I sound like a politician, <coughs> I'm not familiar with all of the, the sections of that bill, but I... My understanding is that it would cut off the right to get continuing work. Yes, because that, it, as I understand it, it would be a one-time payment. Right. The producer. You know, the as long as I've been a member of ASCAP or BMI, there has always been something in front of Congress, which is which is designed to take the royalty away from the composer. <laughs> that always, I can never remember a time that there wasn't something either proposed or in one house or in a committee someplace. Now, I, I've written to um, John Warner and Paul Tribble, who are my, you know, I guess, well, actually, it's not in the Senate, but uh, I've written to the congressman. And the response is always the same from, the, from those people. I have one advantage that I should mention over the ordinary composer. I put a radio station on the air. In 1980, some people, I was burned out from writing a theme song and background music to a kid show called Powerhouse. And, and I was uh, looking for something new to do, and some people hired me to put a radio station on the air, which I did. And I got a chance to really see BMI, ASCAP, and CSAC from the other side. And I agree with, with the licensing organizations, not only because I'm a member of the organization, because I don't always agree with the uh, organizations that I'm members of, but I agree with them that the ultimate use of the music, the user of the music, should be the person who pays for the music. I don't agree that huge budgets should be paid to people to write music, and then they should you know, that it should be cut off from there. I agree more with the concept of the producer, composer working together, creating a product that will be good and that people will want to see over and over again and that broadcasters will be demanded by the public. I want to see that series again. I did a series uh, in 1977 called Footsteps, which is a parenting series of 30 shows. It, it was designed to go one year prime time on PBS. It ran four years prime time because people just kept asking for it. And although the royalties were not real big for any one year, by the time it went prime time four years and then it got into extra payments from BMI and, and, and it's still in rerun on lots of stations, I knew that that was a good series. And I, I don't know, my producer knew that was a good series. But it, it just doesn't, it would not have made sense to build into the budget enough money to make it worthwhile to buy that music all at the same time. I just can't agree, I can't agree with that. I guess it's a political. <clears throat> Maybe I ought to testify in the house. <laughs> yeah, but that's true. There are, there are uses that are hard, hard to uh, police. You know, when you're talking about a broadcast organization, fine. You know, so the next thing is that we broadcast it or something. But you're talking about you know, home video use, that sort of thing. It's just hard to police. Oh, well, see, I have my own feeling about that. I mean, the, the concept was brought up as an educator. How do you feel? As an educator, I feel that if somebody wants to off-air tape a series that I've written for and use it in a classroom situation or at home to get something, I, I think that's wonderful. And I don't care about royalties. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. I, I don't know. Uh, I haven't talked to other composers a lot about that particular thing. But then again, I'm not an ASCAP or BMI uh, officer. You know, I'm just a composer. And I feel that if the program is good enough that people are going to ask for it over and over again to be broadcast, then the composer ought to be paid for it. 
And aside from that, if they want to take it off air and play it, that's 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 the biggest thing that could make me feel happy about any show that I that I write for is that people would want to use it that way. And I like going into into uh, schools where they're using programs, you know, and they just stick in a cassette and use it and do it anytime they want to. I guess the BMI wouldn't approve of that, but I like it. I've forgotten where I was. Somebody will have to refresh refresh my memory. Uh, Okay. Putting music together. By oh, golly, that's what I was doing. Okay. I don't know how much time I have here. If there's somebody that has to leave, and I'll just go as far as I can. There, another aspect of musical instrument digital interface is the ability to have instruments play together too. And I'll demonstrate that for just a moment. On this keyboard, I have the Spender Rhodes electric piano. And this is a, there's a very popular keyboard called the Yamaha DX7. It's probably the most popular uh, keyboard for rock and soul and funk and, and some, even if you saw the, the, the television show, I hope you didn't see it, Ocean Quest. Or, those shows where they're kind of low budget excitement adventure things where they hire a guy like me, you know, to, to, uh, to write some music. This, the, and all the music for that show and other shows too is done by one guy who sits with a drum machine and a DX7 or two. And I don't happen to prefer the keyboard feel of the DX7. I don't like that instrument. But this is the brains of a DX7 right here. This is, this is the TX7. And it's, it has all of the sounds that are in the DX7, and I can access them out of this keyboard. Because you know, I just plug them in, and musical digital interface allows me to choose this keyboard or this keyboard or a combination of the two. Right now, I have this one programmed to play vibes. And this is this keyboard. And this is the vibe sound out of the DX7. Just the volume of it. Or I can play them together. And uh, there's some there's some interesting things that you can do together, like uh, oh violins. I can play. So I can play my keyboard here, and I can add violins playing the same thing here. Now. This instrument is not a digital sampling instrument. The, the sounds in this instrument, are, in this, are not real sounds. The real violin sounds are on, a, are on a disc here. But you can put any number of these things together. You can have eight, nine, ten keyboards all playing different things all at the same time. And you program each one of them to play what you want it to play because they're, they all read time code. And once the time code's there and you've programmed an instrument to do the thing, it will, it will continue to do it. It'll do it over and over whenever it sees that time code. Now, if I want to write a piece of music, let's say I'm writing a little transition piece. Uh, I enter it into, this, this also has memory. Of course, like any good computer, it not only has programs and, and these sounds, but it also has memory. So I just access the memory. done something that it doesn't understand. Uh-oh. Huh. Something's just happened that I've never seen before. Power surge. No, it's, uh, it could very easily be that, that it's very easily affected by magnetic fields. It could be that I'm not, that I'm in a place where there's a lot of magnetism, I don't know. Is there, is there a... Uh, oh, maybe I can't... I don't know what it is. It won't, it 
it won't go into the record mode. Huh. This is this is a new one. Well, tune in next week. <laughs> well, I'll go on. If if I create a bass sound and a keyboard sound and I can create the basic part of what I want. Let's say that I use that I want that keyboard sound that's up top there. And oh, this has some wonderful things. This this is uh, you know it's lost its mind. It's not. No, those those are the ones that connect it to this. This is the. Uh, Maybe this is putting up a magnetic field that it doesn't understand. Let's see here. Yes, I guess that's it. This is a program that somebody made to me, made made and mailed to me because I needed it. I, we have they have a user network for this keyboard, and you can dial a, a 900 number and you pay 50 cents, and you can tell somebody that you need a particular type of program. And I bought this program from that, from that network. I know I can't get into memory. Well, this particular program is, is uh, Indian, Indian and Near Eastern musical sounds. And it also has, has the drums down in the bottom. If I, if I could get into memory, I would show you how that kind of thing is created, but for some reason it won't. I can't get into memory right now. Hmm. Confusion. Confusing. Well, the thing that I would do after creating the bass and, and keyboard sound and drums, of course, I put the drum track down. Uh, first, and it wouldn't necessarily be a drum track, it wouldn't be a trap set, it might be a simple timpani, or it might just be a cue, a metronome track, but whatever it is, it's there on the tape, and I can always reference off of that, and then, let's say I wanted to use, uh, these are some good ones, this is This has, this particular program has piano up top and what's called Fender bass. It's the rock and roll bass that everybody plays down in the bottom. So I, can, so I can play piano and it's also a stereo instrument. You can, you can put them on the two different tracks of the recorder. So I can play... Uh, playing along with my metronome, of course. So when I want to lay the next part on, I just unplug this program. I put in my violin program. I, I, I read the music right off and onto another track of my tape recorder. I put the violin part down. And then I've got, there is everything on this program. I mean, if, if anybody's interested, I'd be happy to, to run a a hundred programs down to you, but I know a lot of people don't have that time. Yes. You said you slow down the, the metronome track so that you can play everything exactly and perfectly. You also slow down the, the soundtrack on this too so that you don't have the chipmunk. How's that all that work? Well, if I could get into... I can't understand why I can't get into the moon right now. For some reason, it won't let me. Well, when you when you're playing it in that mode, does it sound right and then it adjusts itself without changing the pitch? Or how does what does it do? Well, the this instrument, being a a digital keyboard, will remember anything you play into the memory, and then you just have the you can play it back or as fast or slow as you want to. And it, will, pitch it does not change the pitch. No. I, 
So he remembers the sequence of the key of the of the keys, right? I think I may have had a uh, voltage surge. I'm going to turn this thing off and turn it back on, then I, I think I can get into memory. I have a I have a, a protecting strip here that that filters out noise in the AC lines and voltage surges, but sometimes you can just by things that are in the air, <laughs> alternating current in the air. Yep, I'm okay. Okay, I'm going to record. Let's let's just say I'll record what I just played. I'm I'm on all piano now. Now, because, because I've slowed everything down so that I can play it perfectly, I will then want to speed it up appropriately. And I can, I can go into the play mode, which will play back exactly what I've played. And I can, one of the parameters in this machine is the, is the speed. And I can, I mean, we can really take this thing up. There's some things, not being a really, a, really a good keyboard player. There was a, a piece that I wrote recently uh, for a very heartfelt scene in a show that went. Uh, play that the way I really felt it and the way the the producer felt it, he wanted it he wanted it a lot slower than that. I mean he wanted it to kind of sound like, you know, it's just like pulling pulling notes out of an instrument with the mo utmost feeling. So I had the many of the programs that I do, I, you not only can save the sound, you can also save that sequence. Like the sequence I just played, I could save it on a disc. Just get a blank disc and stick it in there and save that sequence. I save a lot of sequences if they haven't been approved by the, by the producer yet. And if he says, yes, I like it, but it's too fast. And then I just come back and access it and slow it down a little bit. And you can do it that way. Well... I don't have my drum machine, I don't have the cable, I forgot it. But the drum machine can be the master controller for everything. Uh, you just have to believe me on that. <laughs> the, the drum box puts out a pulse, and it's not, it's not the same pulse as the metronome. It's a certain number of beats per second. And different instruments, this, this company takes 96 pulses per second. This company used 48, I think. But you can, you can you have a little interface box. You can put all this stuff together. So that all of these keyboards will run together and they will all run to exactly the tempo that this drum machine is setting. The drum machine, meanwhile, is following the time code on my, on my multi-track recorder. So that puts everything together. Then the final touch with any piece of music is playing the live instruments that make it really emotional. Now I like to think that you can really pull emotion out of the digital keyboard, but when you have a lot of instruments together, it takes some doing. I recently did a track. This 
I did a show last week. The producer called me Tuesday night and said, I have to have music for this on Friday. And it was a, there's a, a program for, for almost adult teenagers called Legacy International. Maybe you've heard of it. It's a program where they take good students from all over the world and fly them around the world and acquaint them with basically ecological problems around the world, uh, pollution and, and dumping and that kind of thing. And then they, these kids go back to their own uh, respective countries and, and implement what they've learned about these things. And this particular show is, is a multi, well, the, all the kids are multilingual. There's one kid from the United States, one from Canada, and then they're all from everywhere, Turkey and Israel and Saudi Arabia. And the producer told me, 10.30 in the morning, there's gonna be a tape on the bus. And at 12.30, I'll call you. So he called me at 12.30, by that, that time I had seen the show twice. I looked at the show twice. He talked down the show, he told me where the music was, if we wanted it to be, how long it had to be, where the transitions were, and, and what kind of flavor he wanted. And, if, and many times a, a, a producer will say, I want the flavor of a particular thing. He'll say, um, do you know the piece of music from Cats? You know, do you know that particular thing with that beat, that New York beat or whatever they use? And if I don't have that, normally he will. And I'll get him to play it for me over the phone and I'll take a recorder, you know, over the phone. And try to get these feel, these feels that they're talking about. The, this particular piece that I have this queued up to is I think there's one live instrument on this. There, there's a, a declaration toward the end of the show, a declaration that these kids hold up that is what that they're going to do after they get back to their countries about telling people about the ecology and, and uh, what they've seen. And the, this, he described this piece of music and this was put together all on this synchronism. I don't think there are any live instruments in this piece. on this may, may be completely different. This is the credit piece. He said he wanted kind of a Mediterranean, jazzy, uh, something that would really make you feel kind of uplifted by the end of the show, because the show's really about some pretty depressing things. Uh, there's, a, there's a scene in the show where they, uh, on the southern coast of Spain near Valencia, as I remember, there's a place where they've been dumping the waste from a mine into a bay for 50 years, and there's no bay left. It's all this junk, this sludge. There's no place where you can get a boat in there anymore. I mean, it's pretty depressing, some of it. But at the end, these kids are going off back to their countries, and they're on the 747. They're all joking, laughing, and there's a credit sequence. And he said he just wanted something kind of um, Mediterranean flavor and jazzy. <laughs> Do that on this keyboard again. But basically, what I write, I think the reason that, com that producers come to me for music rather than somebody else is because I write melodic. I like to write melodic things. 
I like to write things, I mean, this is what I do best. But there are other composers who are very good at writing very moody things. One of the composers I worked with, I think he's met Fred Carnes. My, he was a partner of mine on a television series I did a few years ago. He just scored this show called The Image Makers that's at the West End Circle. Has anybody seen it? It's a locally produced movie, um, and he did the score for it. And it's very moody and heavy and um, discordant. Uh, and I don't do that kind of thing well. I don't, I, I just, just don't do it well. But he does it very well. If you get a chance to see that movie, the music is uh, one of the best things about the movie. And aside from that, I don't know what else to tell you, except that I think I've explained everything I came, I said about to do. Can I take another question? Explain everything except how a producer gets in touch with you or hires you. Ah. <laughs> um, when I was in the pit band for this Smokey the Bear film in 1968, uh, I said you said I was playing clarinet. Actually, I was the, I was playing baritone saxophone, and. And it just happened that I was the only baritone saxophone player in the union book at the time in Washington who wasn't busy at that particular time. And I did the most brash thing that I think I've ever done in my life and that I told the, the fellow who was running the recording session that I could write better music than that. And I really, I felt strongly at the time that I could write better music than that. And for some reason, the next time a show came up, he, they called the person that had done that music who was unavailable and they called me and I did the music for the next several years for all those shows that was just luck I mean it was it, I was lucky the guy didn't kick me in the seat of the pants and, ne and never see me again and that's really the way that you get started you have to be in the right place at the right time I can't imagine how somebody how somebody would get break into the business I just can't imagine it. right now I'm unfortunately working under the uh, restrictions imposed by the fact that the company that I work for, Educational Film Center, is not doing a series right now. We're, we're, we're in the proposal stage for a series, which we'd start shooting on uh, in late May. I mean, in September. We'll, kn we'll know in May whether we have the funding or not. But right now, I'm doing what people call me to do. And they, it normally is, can you do it in two days and can you do it for a few hundred dollars? And when you're not doing anything else, you say yes. And that's, that's what I'm doing now. I've just done enough. I've worked for a couple of companies long enough that all the people that I work with at those companies who are now with other people, you know, I get calls from Indiana, from somebody that I used to work with here, and from Denver and New York. It's, uh, it's really just luck. I don't think there's an agency. You know. It's what? I think so. Oh, I know some. Right. And I think that it has the fact that I studied with with uh, a composer who's not well known by the public, but he's well known by other musicians. Uh, when the series that we have in proposal stage right now, I would be traveling around the world with Gunther Schuller, who is a well-known composer and conductor himself, and we would, the series is for the Annenberg Foundation, if we get funding, and we will be exploring the roots of ethnic music, of the major ethnic musics around the world, and they actually use that term, musics. Uh, Gunther Schuller has done this before on a radio program for PBS about 15 years ago. For those of you who don't know Gunther Schuller, he was uh, a French horn player at the Metropolitan Opera. He has conducted, he was head of the Tanglewood, what they call it, Tanglewood Music Fair or something up in Massachusetts. Uh, he's very well known and very outspoken in his defense of real musics, the ethnic musics that uh, live only in the deepest parts of various countries. That's why he's such a defender of jazz in the United States and blues. And he's a defender of real uh, 
real ethnic music from all cultures. And we hope to be able to preserve some of that on tape. And if Annenberg Foundation will finance us, then we'll spend six months traveling around the world filming those things, and then I'll write transition music to, to get from one piece to another sometime next year. It's all just a matter of knowing the people who are doing the, the work. And there's one other thing that I'd like to play. This, this is a demonstration that I did for a local producer. This, this gentleman lives in Silver Spring, and he is the producer of what's called syndicated radio spots. He creates a radio spot, say it's for a bank or a car dealer or something, and he sells it in a number of different markets. All he does is redo the vocals on it. And he came to a, a local ad agency here, a very well-known big ad agency that spends lots of dollars in advertising. And he was talking about the combination of digital technology and recording and how fast you can crank something out. So this fellow from this ad agency came over to his studio one day in Silver Spring and in three hours, we put together a 60-second radio spot. All of the parts, all the instruments, the only live instruments on this, I played one live tenor saxophone and one live trumpet. And everything else is this keyboard and this drum machine. The fellow, the, the syndicator, has since sold this spot. We did this in November. He has since sold this spot in 16 markets. He has sold it to, I think it's called East West Lincoln Mercury here. Uh, they may be using it now, I'm not sure. <laughs> except for one tenor sax and one and one trumpet were recorded on this. This is the drums on that on that spot. And we we sold the guy actually in November. Neither one of us, the recording engineer or myself, were working. And we had to do something. So now we've sold it sixteen times. We we've also produced three more spots in the last six months. And we're doing the same thing with those. But all of this stuff People don't believe it. The ad agency president would, well, he wasn't president, he was a vice president. He would not believe that you can create uh, a soundtrack without having the actual instruments because he's been to too many recording sessions where he sees, a, where he sees 18 people out there all playing. You know. That's all I have to say. I'd like to thank you for coming here. If anybody wants to listen, you can just sit there. I'll run through some of these programs. They're really wonderful programs.